Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. Before we start, I would like to thank all of our listeners, sponsors, and supporters that have helped to make this podcast so successful. The podcast is being heard in all 50 states, all provinces of Canada, and 44 countries around the world. Once again, thank you all so much. And if you would please share the podcast with your friends and family, that would be so much appreciated. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Susan De Lorenzo. Susan is an author, speaker, and certified transformational life coach specializing in helping those recovering from setbacks such as cancer, divorce, and job loss, aka gifts in disguise, using proven techniques for success. After more than 20 years in the financial industry, Susan answered a deep calling to reach others with a message that a healthy, fulfilling life is not just for the few. Susan is a survivor of invasive breast cancer whose marriage fell apart directly following her year of treatment. Susan is an expert in helping women coming out of life-altering adversities identify the gems that brought insight, experience, and self-knowledge to them, working with them to use what they know how to design and create their lives in alignment with what evokes deep satisfaction with oneself and positive feelings toward the future. Welcome, Susan, to the podcast. Hey, Ron. Thank you so much. Great to be here. It's great to have you, and I... uh, can't wait to get into this because uh, we're both, we both have something in common. We're both uh, breast cancer survivors. Susan, Amazing, tell us, yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about your life prior, uh, you know, up to your 38th uh, birthday, your family, your work life, that kind of thing. So the audience gets, it's a little uh, knowledge of what you're sure. about and everything. Sure. Well, as you mentioned in the in the intro too, I, I was working in the financial industry. I had what I like to call my corporate cubicle job. <laughs> I was a mother of a very small, uh, eighteen month old, and uh, and there was never enough of me to go around. I was a co owner of this old house and had a very mercurial marriage. You'd, I was just always walking on eggshells. I never, at the time, I just thought, well, this is the best you can do, Susan. You made your bed. You have to lie in it. Oh, well, <laughs> you, draw wow. the, you drew the short straw. Sorry about that. But you would never mm. know it looking at me wrong because I would walk in, makeup on the face. Hey, everybody, great to be here. How's it going? So-and-so, you know, uh, you know, loved going into uh, Boston where I was working at the time on the train, had all kinds of train buddies, but at home, it was a whole other story. You you know, you know, Susan, I just got to interrupt you. You know, sometimes you just, you see people and and you say, wow, they really got it made. Mm. You know, they, they look so happy. And I mean, just take a look at Tom Brady, I guess you could. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, and then you find out uh, it's not really all that all that roses and stuff. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, we don't know the battles that people have. Battle, maybe challenge. Okay. But yeah, yeah, it that, you know, we we put on a good face, we have our game face, right? Right. And then we take it off when we get home and we deal with what we got to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So I was very stressed. And in me time for me was, you know, I was just last on the list. So like, even getting to that mammogram that set off everything, was like me time because I had to go. I had a mother who was a breast cancer survivor. And it turns out when I was diagnosed at age 38, I was the same age as she was. And we both lost our sa- the same breast, right wow. breast. Uh, so it was like mother, like daughter. And I never thought that I would get it. I mean, I know we talk about genetics and, you know, you better watch out. I was being told to have a mammogram beginning at age 35 because of my mom's history, but I never thought I would get it because I thought I look nothing like her. I, she's tall and thin and blonde and I'm stocky. You know, I just, but you know, hello genetics, you know, and maybe it isn't genetics. I didn't take the BRCA test, but um, yeah, that was just uh, quite um, a marker for me that, wow, I'm the same age as my mom. I'm going to lose my right breast just like mom did. So at 38 years old, you're diagnosed with invasive breast cancer in the left breast, uh, af- after having just a routine, uh, mammogram, uh, 
so did you have a, a lumbectomy or whatever? And, and what ensued after that pertaining to the right breast? Yes. Because I understand there's a story behind that. Yes, that is, uh, that was the, you know, <laughs> you know, where you think you've got out okay, like I only had a little cancer in the left breast and the lumpectomy took care of it. And they had, you know, people know what clean margins is. That means that with the tissue they took, there was no cancer on it. So they were, they got clean, a good, you know, right. they got the cancer out of there. So I had to go for a follow-up. My surgeon sent me to a radiation oncologist to see if I would need radiation. And I had in my head, oh, they got clean margins. I'm not going to need this thing. She brings me in. She looks at my chart. She agrees with me. She says, you're right. I don't think you need radiation. But while you're here, I've got a medical student here. Do you mind if we do a breast exam? And hey, anything for science. Okay, come on in. Here, sure. you know, at this point between childbirth and all the surgeries I've had, I'm just like, come on. Yeah, whatever. Everybody, <laughs> take a look at my bod. Um, so uh, yes, she starts, first she starts palpating the, the breast that was operated on. Everything was good. Then she goes to the right breast and she's spending a little extra time in this one section of my breast. And she stops and she looks at me and says, has anyone ever uh, talked to you about the lump in your right breast? And you know how time can just stop? And yeah. I was just in, the, in that gut, ugh, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, and being the busy working mom that thought I had to hold up the whole world, I'm like, I don't have time for this. There was actually a book out at the, at the time that this all happened called Breast Cancer. Let me check my schedule. I thought, <laughs> oh man, what a great book title that is. Um, and so, yeah, I even put off having this next um, biopsy. I was like, I'm going to my high school reunion and then I'm going to the beach with my family. So you're going to have to wait a few weeks. And I only would believe because the first one was just almost like stage zero cancer. It was just right. early, early stages. So the next one, I was just like, oh, it's just going to be for sure the same as the other one. I well, could Su not. Yeah. Susan, let me ask you, did they do a mammogram on that right breast? Yeah, it wasn't caught. And, and they didn't find any. They and didn't and, this, and this, was a, this was like a student doctor? No, this was a top-notch Dana-Farber radiation oncologist. No, no, the one who caught it, the one who was palpitating. Yes, this is the one. Oh. She, Yeah, the student was in the room, but she was okay. the one who said, hey, lady, has anybody talked to you about the lump in your right breast? Wow. Yeah. So she found it. She, she saved my life because I could have just gone like, whoa, I just had a little cancer. Oh, well, you know, and that's how I walked away. I didn't make me change my life, Ron. It wasn't like, oh, I better be careful. I just almost got cancer, you know. Um, it was yeah. almost like, okay, we tried to shake you with just a little cancer. Let's just dope slap you with, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing like the universe kind of thing, like yeah. you know, a little devil's advocate there. But yeah, I, I really, that stepped me awake. That snapped me awake. Well, you know, uh, that's when you have to start thinking divine intervention. You know, she, yes. she just was there at the right time. Yes, I do. You know? I do believe that, Ron. Yeah. yeah. So after treatment is completed one year and then undergoing, uh, you had reconstructive surgery, right? Yeah. Once I was done with treatment, I waited. I, I pretty much walked around with, you know, a prosthesis um, for like 15 months. And it's a really, um, I don't know what the demoralizing moment where you take this prosthesis out of this special bra and you can fool yourself while you're walking around in it, but you know, it's still warm in your hand and you're directed to wash it and put it in a box every night. And there's just something that you relive. I did um, every night. So by the time I was so ready to have that surgery um, by the time it came around. And it was a very uh, tough surgery. It was like a five hour surgery called tram flap where they take uh, belly flat and muscle, be belly fat and muscle and they tunnel it up to make a, a mount for a breast. And um, I actually call it belly boob. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I went to the uh, cosmetic surgeon, he was a great guy. Um, but, you know, the nurse is in the room 
he grabs my post baby belly and says, I think we have enough to work with here. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, I knew that would come in handy one day. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing hearing your story and, and I, I've, you know, gone through the process myself, mm. but people who never had cancer, they really don't realize what you have to go through. It's not just uh, one of those uh, slam bam, you know, uh, like a, a knee replacement or something like that. You know, it's mm. you're in, it's you're in, out and on your way. It, it's involved. Yes. It, and it's complicated and it can get real complicated real fast mm -hmm. uh, with drugs and everything. So yeah, people just, people who don't, you know, and, and I hope nobody ever has to, you know, right. be in that world, but, but they just don't realize, you know, what's all involved. You made me re remember my first walk to my chemotherapy session mm -hmm. and i'm like i know this sounds dumb but it's like wow there are a lot of sick people here yeah you know because i still felt fine ron i i mean yeah, yeah i, I had too. this diagnosis um but i'm walking yeah. in and there are these just war weary looking people that are getting their umpteenth um infusion and i'm like hey it's day one hi everybody yeah. you know and uh Boy, wasn't the smile wiped off of my face by the end of the first infusion. Well, I mean, just my first chemo. Uh, yeah. It was almost like I was packed for a picnic. I had a, a whole duffel bag full of uh, mittens that I froze for my hands, oh. for my feet, you know, so I didn't get neuropathy. I put ice in my mouth the whole time I was getting the infusion so I wouldn't get sores there. Uh, loaded up with a blanket and uh uh water i mean it was it was crazy you know you must have done a lot of reading or somebody really prepped you yeah yeah you have to you know you have to be your own advocate on that mm -hmm. believe me uh so anyway that time period uh there is a divorce and what i, I what i read is the divorce rate uh the national the nas national average is uh 50 percent for uh for cancer patients what are your thoughts on that and and, and yeah. why why is that you know what what do you think what do you think is it just the caretaker poops out or what's your thoughts on that you know it's actually higher than the national average divorce after cancer is actually higher Be, and i really i can tell you in my own way everything when you're the boat's not rocking too hard people can cope yeah but you're really just revealing i think what you know what's behind when things aren't so well you know it's almost like that phrase you find out who your friends are <laughs> when yeah, right. you're, yeah when you're down and out oh yeah well i think that's true for a marriage too and i already knew i had picked a tough one I already knew that I was walking on eggshells, that I had a really um, challenging uh, marriage. And it wasn't that this man wasn't funny and uh, irreverent and, you know, really as, as a friend part of it, but the part of him that was very difficult was um, depression. Depression, and I grew up with it. My mom had depression and I was, and it was an unconscious thing where you're like, hey, I know how to do this. I, I, I'm just going to fit my peg right there and there. Look at that. I know how to, you know, protect myself or stay on the approval chart and uh, dodge it when he's got that dark mood on his face. And yeah, it, it was not uh, intentional, but it was natural. And um, it was just when I was out of cancer treatment. I was just getting a little hair on my head. And he had said something, uh, Dana Farber, where I was treated in Boston, had a great program for couples um, going through cancer. And so mm. both of us go and we're talking about, and it's great because the mate has, my husband had to uh, take care of our little boy who was not even two and um, go to work just like always and, and take extra responsibility for the house and me so it's a lot on a partner anyway yeah. Yeah. and to have somebody who's already beleaguered 
and has his own personal challenges, boy, I bet he just wanted to run screaming, but he brought me to every infusion. He really did the best he could until he couldn't do it anymore. And um, yeah, in the big picture, he did me the biggest favor of my life, you know, by yeah. cutting, cutting it loose. Did you get ghosted by anybody for friends? Yeah, you know, and you and I were talking a little bit about my writing a book. And one of the chapters in the book is called Loved Ones Can Disappoint <laughs> and, and Strangers Can Delight. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's really uh, my take on this is they just don't know what to do with you. They don't know what to do, how to be. And and again, it can be that nobody loves you when you're down and out thing. But um I think there's just an ineptitude and a nervousness and almost like it's contagious sometimes, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Cause I found that, you know, you would, who you think would step up to the plate, oh, they're gone. Yeah. And who yeah. you, who you never thought would come out of the woodwork, there they are. Yes. Go, wow. What the heck is going on? Right. But, and, and so what's the blessing there, right? Yeah. Is to say, wow, it all balanced out. Not how I expected it, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, for sure. Susan, what led you to pursuing life coaching uh, from the financial industry you were in? I was so bored at my job, but I was so afraid to leave it, especially as a single mom. So it was really being laid off. That was like, okay, I can go back and try to recreate and be the administrative assistant in, in marketing that I have always been these last 20 years, or I can see what else is out there. And it wasn't like I jumped right to life coaching. I actually um, was trying to get into holistic um, food marketing or holistic treatment markets. I, through my cancer treatment, I really changed the way I ate. Uh, how I exercised, I eliminated sugar, I did things that I knew were going to help me moving forward. So I was enthusiastic about that. But it wasn't panning out for me. And I ended up contacting a, a group out in California, the American Holistic Health Association, like, hey, can you guys give me East Coast names that I can contact? And they're like, no, I, we really can't. But how about if you write an article for us? And I had never you know, I wrote at work sometimes, but this was cool. I was like writing about um, the emotional freedom technique, EFT or tapping, and how I used it to get rid of my addiction to sugar. And so I wrote this article and they liked it. And, it, and I was like, wow, I'd like to do that again. Um, and then I... Um, I saw an ad on Facebook. I had to think, Ron. Yeah, I saw an ad on Facebook. And it was like, would you like to be a speaker, a teacher, a coach? And I said, click, yes. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, a group um, that Mary Morrissey, a lot of people know her in the transformation, transformational industry. But uh, I clicked on this ad. And then I ended up meeting with one of the uh, counselors. And she asked me a bunch of questions. And the next thing you know, my knees are knocking and I want to throw up and I've just given her my credit card and I'm going to be, uh, you know, being trained as a life coach. Yeah. And it was the oh, horrible moment. And then I sat down, my knees stopped and I said, I just did the right thing. And it took, <laughs> I, I don't know if I, if I hadn't have done that, I don't know what I'd be doing today. You had a gut feeling it was the right thing. I did. I did. Yeah. It scared the heck out of me, though. What do you consider the most important things we can do uh, to support ourselves during personal crisis? I love that question. I think the first thing is really to go back to your breath and being calm, because there's a whole part of us that wants to explode, right? And, mm -hmm. and we should, we have an opinion about it. We can have our opinion. The other thing is not to resist what's happening. There's a big part of us that wants to put up a fight and say, this can't be, I mean, yeah, I, I, we all have to go through it, but then we let it go. Uh, notice that you're resisting and say, okay, I don't have a choice. I've been, I've got this diagnosis. 
I, I, I remember when I had to um, face the fact that I was going to have to have chemo. I could not get my brain around that. And I knew how hard chemo could be. And I got home with my husband after this meeting with the surgeon. And I, he was walking out the door and I yelled at him, I don't want to do this. And he just said it in this super calm voice. Well, you have to. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I, I guess I do. Yeah. And, and it was just kind of that trajectory. And then the third thing I would say to this, Ron, is, you know how you, your brain wants to go to the worst case scenario, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. That's human nature. We kind of want to defend ourselves. And well, it, if it hasn't happened yet, what would it look like for the most ideal outcome? How about if we could, if, you know, acknowledge, okay, neither of these has happened. Where do I want to put my focus? I want to put my focus on the ideal outcome. And this other one can, it's still going to wave at me and say, you should be afraid. This, this look at that statistic. Well, we're not a statistic, right? We're right. individuals on a journey and our mindset means everything. Yeah, it is. It is the mindset. And, and I always tell myself, because I, I, I'm going through some stuff now with, you know, uh, collateral damage from the surgery and that mm. uh, it's one day at a time. Yeah. You gotta who take are you going to be on that day? Who, who do you need to be like today? Right. And when you wake up tomorrow, right? Yeah. You can't give up and uh, you have to stay positive. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to go down a rabbit hole real fast. Yeah. And, and boy, once you do, it's, it's spirals. It's, you know, what it's like that, you know, a snowball that turns into an avalanche. I, I think uh, I'm really, I'm glad you understand that. The other thing I bring up to people and you don't have to give it a, a special name, but it's just to acknowledge a higher power and, and pull in divinity and say, I can talk to this divine power. I can call upon it for strength. I um, look at the magic of life and the funny synchronicities in life. You know, that's the magic of life. Why wouldn't it be there for you in your darkest hour? You know, my personal philosophy on that is similar to yours. I would say, let's do the right thing that's offered to us, make a, make a, a, a good decision. And if there's your doctors are telling you to do whatever, you know, go with what they're saying. But after that, put it in God's hands. Yeah. You know what, you know what I mean? Just, I mean, it, you did everything you could to, to, to get up to, to get a good outcome, you know, a, a whatever, whatever you're doing in life, you know, mm -hmm. do the right thing. But after that, it, it's really out of your hands. It's out of your control. Yeah. You know what I would add to that, Ron, is also if you're trusting that internal GPS, you're going to check what's resonating with you also when you're offering um, decisions to make. And I think learning to trust that, we're not brought up to trust that. We're, we're always looking to external experts and there are external experts, but then when they say something, you go, yeah, that feels right. That feels good. I think you're right about that. I'm gonna do that. Um, and, and, but sometimes not, right? Like I right. knew uh, in one case, I wasn't gonna have reconstructive surgery at the same time as the mastectomy because I had to do all this chemo and, and that recovery was going to be a, a, a bear, you know? So um, yeah, resonance is also a great thing to, you know, working with intuition, working with re resonance and trusting in that, especially when your life is on the line. I think yeah. uh, you don't put it, you put it, like you said, in God's hands and you, and you trust in this, little what i call the inner gps yeah good 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 comment there what is your top recommendation for people just just coming out of an adversity what do you recommend give yourself some time don't feel like you have to um make big decisions there's some unpacking to do there's some recovery to do even if it's not cancer or surgery right? If it's a blow right. of divorce, bankruptcy, 
you know, there are certain actions you're, you're going to be forced to take, right? You've got to go grocery shopping. You've got to keep the roof over your head, whatever. But the rest, you got to allow of some space. You're not going to have epiphanies right away. I didn't. Uh, I didn't see that I, you know, had the lowest self-esteem of anybody I knew. I had to look back and see that I didn't get that right away. So there's some reflection that needs to happen. First, there's decompression, and then there's reflection. And All I think right. a journal is an awesome tool at this point. I, I wanted to write a book called I can't believe this all just happened to me after <laughs> cancer, divorce, and then um, falling in love again. So, you know, give yourself the time, give yourself the space. And that's a great time to pull in a therapist or somebody you can talk to. So were you able to find anything uh, positive coming out of the cancer and the divorce? Yes, not right away. But the interesting thing, Ron, was that, you know, when you've been through cancer, divorce doesn't seem as scary. <laughs> right, right. You know, I knew I was going to still be alive after, you know, and my, my um, motto, or whatever you want to call it, mantra motto, um, with coming out of cancer, and I'm a uh, t more than 20 year survivor now is until otherwise notified I'm cured. I don't like um, the words remission. I think that's like waiting for another shoe to drop. And I can't live my whole life like that. Because I, I can't that would just be like a punch to the gut every day thinking, Oh, God, is it going to come back, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, right. is it a possibility? Yeah, it's a possibility I could get hit by a bus too, but I'm not going to run around thinking that way. Right. Um, yeah. So in answer to your question, yeah, relatively speaking, that was it. And I noticed, okay, I don't have to walk on those eggshells anymore. I can make a new choice for myself going forward, but I had to learn what my part was in it as a person who is codependent with people with depression. So I can make a new choice the next time around when the opportunity presented itself. Now, in your life coaching practice, Susan, uh, what have you found to be the most prominent struggles your clients work to overcome after adversity? I think it's believing that they could actually create something new and more. A lot of people try to recreate what they used to have, and this is who I am, how can I make my life look like that again? And that's where I love, um, first of all, I don't accept uh, when we're talking about adversity, I don't want somebody right after an adversity to come to me as a life coach. I like a little bit of space so that they have that reflection time and they can tell me what they would really love. Like if I could wave a magic wand, what would you love your life to look like? do you really want the same thing you just had? Or would you love uh, to do different work in the world? Uh, how is your health? Do you love how your health is? How about your relationship? How's your time and, and money freedom? Are you feeling good about that? There's got to be something. And the idea is you're a different person now. You're not the same person that walked into that adversity. And, you know, adversity makes us like cough up courage, right? Oh, yeah. yeah want to be but it's like it's forced on you you're either going to fall into like a little ball and melt or you're going to have to stand there and face what's coming at you and what if we did that in building a dream and not shying away from all the discomfort of doing something we've never done before what if we took that thing what we were forced to do and said, okay, that's my new tool now. I got this. I don't love feeling uncomfortable, but what if I got used to feeling uncomfortable in the interest of growth, in the interest of having that shiny thing I say I want? You ever look back at all the stuff you've been through and go, how, how the heck did I ever do all that? Yeah, it makes me really, I guess you can say proud, but love that person, love her so much for what she didn't know, but which also what she was willing to learn, what she was willing to overcome, 
And you know that phrase, I, I'm sure you do, that make your mess your message. Yeah. It was just a natural thing for me to want to go here. I was already like in the office in, in my cubicle being a life coach because um, it's not like I jumped right from breast cancer survivor to life coach. I was in that job for quite some time, but I knew a thing or two. And I was very encouraging to other people. Other women going through cancer were in my office. And I was all at the ready uh, with uh, my experience and my right. encouragement. Right. You were helping. How do we focus on what's possible for us when the hurt and the replay of our adversity uh, keeps running in the background long after the experience is over? Yeah, it's really important. And I love this simple phrase, that was then and this is now. And it's human nature, just being aware, okay, that's what my mind wants to do. It's just a human experience to live from the past and to be trained to live in the now with eyes on the future, loving what you've learned, loving what you have right now is a magnet to greater abundance. Uh, living in lack and disappointment is just a recipe for more of the same. Right. It's, it's human nature, but it can be overridden. And that takes practice. And we go back to mindset on that. And um, I believe filling uh, your bookshelves and podcasts and uh, YouTube and anything else going to seminars that are going to build you up and reprogram your mind so that you're not the glass half empty person you may have been before or in trauma, in shock. And that's where, you know, a, a therapist can help you unpack that. But someone like a life coach is going to um, have you leverage it. Well, what was one of your biggest insights after cancer and divorce that served you uh, the most as you moved forward? That I am so much more uh, than I ever thought I was. I felt such a love for myself that uh, to this day serves me in, in anything I want to do. Um, my level of deserving, my level of feeling worthy, and um, the excitement for poss new possibilities in my life. I never had that before. I think I started the podcast by saying, oh, well, this is what you get too bad for you, you know? Yeah. And now you, I, I would never, ever say that. I never believe that. Right. Now, Susan, you have a book coming out entitled uh, Pulling the Gems from Adversity. I don't know if it's out yet or not. That brings the reader through five stages that you describe as ad, from adversity to awesome. <laughs> can, can you briefly cover those stages for us? I'd be happy to. And is the book out? No, it is being edited right now. So I will let you know. And I'll, boy, when you see that, Ron, you're going to see like fireworks over in Nokomis, Florida, because okay. it has been uh, quite, um, yeah, many sidetracks. And I know many uh, writers will tell you this and you're wondering, oh my gosh, somebody finally told me, um, that it was like eight years from the time they started their book. And I'm like, oh, please, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the first section uh, I call holding firm in a storm. And it's a lot what we just talked about, you know, how, um, what do you do in an adversity, right? Mm -hmm. And where are you gonna put your focus? How are you gonna stay calm? Where are you gonna use uh, to help with worry? Um, the second one, a kind glance backward. That's what I was talking about when you're letting um, your life settle a little bit and you're getting some feedback, you're getting some reflections. Wow, I was really, I picked a tough marriage. I uh, really had to walk on eggshells. I never thought I deserved this. Um, so yeah, what's coming up for you there? And then the third is creating life anew, anew excuse me. And that is where I was talking about leveraging your adversity and 
starting to dream and imagine what you would love your life to look like, even if you can't recognize any of that in your current situation. Uh, the fourth one is not everything can come with you. Low self-esteem, low expectations, uh, resentment, jealousy, anger. You're not going to get very far on creating life anew if you have to drag those things around yeah, with you. Sure. And so that's really important. And then the fourth one is just, okay, if you've gotten this far, advance boldly. Take, take a chance. You know, nothing's guaranteed in this world. And nobody wants to get to the end of their life and find out they didn't live it. I'm paraphrasing uh, Thoreau. <laughs> <laughs> so we covered all, was that all five? That is all five. I hope okay. so. <laughs> so I want to go, I, I want to, I want to go back on one of those in your book. Uh, you dedicate an entire section to looking backwards. Why would anyone coming out of adversity? Why would they want to do that? That's where the, the real gold is because you had to see who you were while you're going through it. And not only that, and you and I talked about this too in the beginning of the show, who were you, Susan, at age 38? Who were you before then? That's what we're looking at too. Because nobody just gets like one brick upside the head, right? And then you're on your way. Yeah. Life keeps circling back around to teach you something else, to pull something else out of you. We want to know what that stuff is because that's the gold. It's not just, you know, you know, what a loser you were. Let's beat that into the ground, right? right. You know, how could you have not known um, what you needed to know? Well, you didn't then, but now you do. What are you going to do about it? But not to look at it and just to say, oh, where was I? I'm the, um, a single working mom or I'm a mom of, uh, in a rotten marriage who um, is working herself to death and doesn't have any time with her little child. I think I'll recreate that. No, thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, well, that answers that. What, what is it you hope most of the readers are going to take away from reading your book? That anything is possible. That there's nothing um, short of death <laughs> that needs to stop them from moving forward. Even, uh, even trauma these days, there are so many great programs to help people with trauma and doing the brain work. Uh, like I mentioned, um, EFT, that's a big one, EMDR, but there, it's trained therapy. There's so many ways that we don't have to stay stuck and we don't have to stay in our story. We create a new story uh, and it's based on noticing two things, longing and discontent. Those are two strong spiritual uh, signals. Discontent really doesn't let you go. I was sitting in that desk job going, how much longer do I have to do this? As if somebody above was going to come down and say, okay, another year and we're going to let you out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like that. And then it would be, oh, you'd see somebody doing um, podcasting, right? Or uh, public speaking or being an author. I would love to do that. Or traveling to Hawaii. I would love to go there. Notice that. That's coming from a deep part of you. Susan, how can people contact you? Oh, you can find me on my website, susandelorenzo.com, S-U-S-A-N-D-E-L-O-R-E-N-Z-O, -E -E uh, or on email, susan at susandelorenzo.com. I also have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash dreamcoachsusan. And I think those are the big ones. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. <laughs> but that's okay. that's where I do the most work. Okay, I'm going to put uh, those links on the podcast notes for everybody. If you want to get a hold of Susan, I'll have her email, her website, her Facebook, her Twitter, and her LinkedIn. I want to thank you, Susan, so much for sharing your story with us and for all the important work uh, you are doing to help people dealing with adversity issues. I wish you nothing but success with the book and your work. Thank Comments you and suggestions. Uh, for the podcast, you can email me at it's a wrap with rap at gmail.com. Uh, the website is it's a wrap with rap.com. We have uh, all the episodes, uh, sponsors, spotlight, members, moment, and all kinds of resources on there. 
Our Facebook uh, page and group is It's a Wrap with Rap. Instagram, we're on Instagram, uh, growing very nicely. We're in the thousands of followers. It's a Wrap with Rap podcast. We're on YouTube. All the episodes are on YouTube. It's a Wrap with Rap, the podcast uncut. I want to thank everyone for listening. And for now, it's a wrap.